Welcome to episode 11 of What's in the Box. We do this every week, Thursday at noon central time. My name is Togar Alpaga, VP of Marketing at Tatsoft. And with me every week is Mark Tacolini, our founder and CTO. How are you today, Mark? I'm great. Thank you. Uh, last week, we started kind of doing what we call Factory Studio Fundamental Series, where we wanted to kind of cover some of the basic highlights that we wanted to make sure that you are aware of. And we're going to continue that journey this week. Uh, Mark is going to talk a little bit about some considerations uh, when you approach a new project. So I'm going to step aside here and Mark, take it away. Oh, yes, definitely. And frankly, I would start right away from message. If you like the fundamentals and you need more of that, or if the audio quality on the last <laughs> head shoes, in two weeks from now, uh, you can put in your agenda, we'll do one more of those fundamental sessions. You to be May, uh, I'm looking at the calendar, to be May 13, the dates, okay? Okay. And we'll reveal many of those concepts we did with some additional contents. Sounds great. And today we are going to explore how to approach to create a new project. <laughs> what, how you should, what kind of information should collect, how should start to organize your application. And uh, the first thing you should, I'll give a little example why those concepts are important. Uh, if you're familiar with Microsoft Word and Mi Microsoft Excel, uh, both of them, you can create reports in some sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Especially what kind of report is. Uh, there is, of course, much, lots of calculation in Excel, but just to put like a letter explaining how was your report in your vacation. <laughs> and <laughs> you write a letter in Word. But anyway, it depends on the contents. You select a tool. But there is other way around. If you know the tool you have in hands is Excel, when you are collecting with your user the information you have, you can ask questions that you map almost directly to the formatting, to the formulas, <laughs> knowing the tool also helps you to organize even the specification of the projects. <laughs> mm -hmm. So today, what I'm going to talk is a little bit of both. Some concepts I'll talk that apply generically whatever new automation or IoT project are starting. But some of the procedures, some of the concepts, they take in consideration that the tool is the touch software frameworks, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I will uh, share my uh, display here so you can see that. Okay. And open here our them projects. And even before I... We may have lost Mark here.
my audio toggle. Is it back? Yeah, we lost yeah. there, Mark. So yeah, for every reason, I start my parallels virtual machine. <laughs> it didn't like at all. But was about to explain is uh, if you if you're working a basic uh, human machine project a few years back that you are showing data from a Modbus device. <laughs> It was very important to know all the details on all the Modbus addresses you are going to read, <laughs> because some old products you even had to put on the screen the address of your remote points. <laughs> mm -hmm. If we do a project, an IoT or a traditional SCADA or any application around frameworks, it's very easy to select uh, the protocol, if it be Modbus or Waco. <laughs> so you can do a full automation project <laughs> and select only on the very last minutes <laughs> if the data acquisition will be from Waco, from Siemens, or from Modbus. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in fact, there are some integrators that they lay out their HMI projects so they can pick up any of those data sources to different end users, they are selling the application. <laughs> okay. So if you have that in mind, if you know it's that easy to replace the communication, it's not really necessary to have beforehand or on beginning of the application, all the details of those addresses. You mm -hmm. see my point? <laughs> no, understood, yeah. So of course you need to know to your project that are collecting data from a PLC. But the exactly addresses or even the equipment itself that are collecting the data, that's no longer a requirement you should collect with too much effort beforehand or on the beginning of your project, we, you start with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the way you approach a project now, they should take in account the features of those new technologies. We, what are those features? Nowadays, it's very easy to replace data connections, <laughs> to pick up data from here to there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or it's also very easy when we have an object to put that object in many displays or modify calculations around those objects. So those tasks of connectivity, data flow, that was very hard to do in the past, they are much easier now. <laughs> that allows you, when developing a project, having some flexibility to even define some of those things as you go. Sometimes mm -hmm. even modifying some, specific some specifications from the POC, the proof of concepts, to the final pilot or to final implementation. Okay. So, uh, Okay, so if all that's easy, what where I should start? <laughs> yeah. What's <too> valid? <laughs> well, one thing very important is uh, to be able to really leverage things like object orientation, classes, and some concepts that perhaps you're not familiar with. Let's try to make it more simple. Is to have a good modeling or a good uh, data model of your application. Instead of worrying about uh, tag names, connections, on how you build a screens, uh, by our experience in most of the applications, you should really understand uh, the model, meaning what will be the data, what will be the representation, what you want to show from each equipment, or what kind of high level uh, information you want to interact with that process. <laughs> okay. Not worrying too much on the beginning, on the implementation, on the products. But meaning, okay, what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm showing data from the turbines that are powering solar panels. <laughs> so what is the data model for a turbine? <laughs> what mm -hmm. are uh, the items of the turbine that will be relevant for me? and what I will need, uh, what kind of access you to be only to get data or I need to feedback something in that execution of the fields. 
-hmm. So you should start before trying to, to touch too quickly the software, really put some old style <laughs> engineering design on the system <laughs> to understand your process, understand your machinery, understand the data models that you have behind, behind those machineries and mm -hmm. behind those devices, okay? <laughs> Makes when sense. I say like that, it sounds a little too much 101, <laughs> but it's not because we fre frequently we have people trying to start right away with defining mappings and in importing mappings from Excel or import uh, CSV files, this and that, and create huge tables with text. Uh, but they don't have a custom user data types, they don't really understand if you ask tricks but okay what are the base components and what are the data models and what is the information flow you want on that system mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes that's not very clear <laughs> okay uh so yeah. far so good Stoger. i see any questions no, think... from you or from the audience no i i don't see any questions yet if you do have any questions you can drop them yeah, either please, on youtube or linkedin I will not try to go specific with one project, so it will be very generic. And if I have specific questions, definitely will help me. Okay, I will try again to start my parallel VM in my Mac. Okay, the last time I did that, uh, fingers crossed here. Yeah, yeah, uh, I was. Uh, I got this uh, the parallels VM send a technical data report that he wasn't able to start okay and okay. telling me that i need to do an update so you guys know what did happen with me <laughs> in <laughs> those minutes that i was out okay mark so, i got a question here for you uh i'm ahead. popping on the screen here from Hezron. can you see that uh he said, when you're referring to data model of the system, what are you referring to exactly? He said, it sounds okay. interesting. Okay, well, uh, for, uh, I will try to say very simple words because if, if there is a data analyst or someone who work with modeling, I, I excuse myself first of all because the things I will do, I will try to say that in work based concepts. What I mean, uh, you should as much as possible, instead of trying to to simple variable by variable, like the old HMI project, you have tag one, tag two, temperature first one. You should try to define it, templates or user data types or custom data types uh, that you can model what you're going to do. So if you have that going example of the turbine, is the turbine has some sub components or all the variables that I want to define they are at the turbine level, <laughs> or there is some kind of sensor that the sensor itself has three or four standard properties. <laughs> so when you start to understand the components of your system, you start to define which data it's important to each component. So in going back to that example, if I work with a standard sensor that have the measurement, the status, <laughs> and uh, disable or out of range switch. That's one little piece of data or data modifying to call that you create a user data type or a template called sensor <laughs> with those three properties. <laughs> and then when I start to think about my turbine, what is my turbine? Oh, uh, my turbine has two sensors of that type. <laughs> has also a current, has also <laughs> a speed, has also an output. So this is the data that's relevant for my turbine. And I always talk a lot about the data because even before you go to the visual representations or the analytics or the advanced insights you can have, <laughs> in that kind of real-time application, that's what we work. On the end of the day, it's about the raw data. <laughs> mm -hmm. It really starts very simple <laughs> with the data. And the more you can understand and put some uh, structure around that data, as much as possible, mapping that data to the components 
or creating data structures that make sense to you to understand your process, understand your equipment. That's what I call, in very layman terms, data modeling. <laughs> okay. If now you he's ask follow up. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say he's got a follow up to that. What he's saying. So it's basically the variables that are, you are measuring? Yes, uh, but it's more than that. Okay. You need to organize uh, those variables in data structures. You put uh, variables that are related because they are part of the same equipment or they are part of the same calculation. Okay. The way you organize the data uh, really depends on what kind of view you want to see of the data. <laughs> uh, because sometimes if an application call uh, for OEE, you may create a data model that you have in the same structure, data from different machines in your production line. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you're doing something that more like predictive maintenance, you create data structures where each machine has its own little data structure. <laughs> so you start with the variables you are measuring and the variables you want to feed back. Mm -hmm. But now we start to organize that data in what the people use call user data types or templates mm -hmm. or data structures. <laughs> And so you have that little islands <laughs> of data and start organizing if this data is part of this machine or this data is isolated and they have some connection between them. That's the measurement with a little of top structure on top of that. OK, thank you for that explanation, Mark. Appreciate it. And Hezron, if you have any other questions, let us know. But I yes, think and now I, I see the you. And OK, so uh, it seems uh, my Parallels VM is back. So let me again uh, go to uh, share uh, my screen. OK. It seems this time it's not complaining. OK. <laughs> so. Uh, Going back to the to that basic explanation, uh, things about, of course, you need to know what arrange the data. But frankly, as we're going to see, uh, that can be very basic, uh, uh, to very easy to switch. So when you go here to the Factory Studio interface, uh, are you seeing that well now? Yes, so, you're coming through. OK. Well, uh, very basic thing, you start a new project, that's where you go, okay, to start a new project, okay? Uh, don't worry too much about the project name, you can replace that in a little bit, but there is, of course, some base decision you need to do. If I you're going to use the full .NET framework or if the project should be running in Linux, and our recommendation there is quite simple. Right now, the .NET framework is way more powerful that we can do in Linux. Linux can be a good solution if you're, if you're going to deploy edge devices and you, you want to get rid of Windows on those edge devices or mm -hmm. the supplier you are considering to use the hardware, they have a good Linux box uh uh but again you can use linux to be a server side application as well as well we can very easy run dot uh, net on embed devices but a very base high level it's dot net you can use all of the places linux right now it's being a little more used on edge devices as an option uh harder than uh, the it applications okay Okay. And you should not really, uh, right now, uh, don't worry if your application is enterprise or gate express, uh, our support and say people help on that. Okay? okay. And over time, use the product to understand that's just to make a little more cost effective some solutions. But if you work with enterprise, you can do, uh, that's how I do. And uh, we support, when you create the application, uh, some base options that you can create a, a zero screens 
or you can create some basic navigation, or you can put some trade charts and alarms, or you can create a project to be used for redundancy. So those are some basic templates that we have published. But many integrators, they have their own templates to start the projects. And we are also create some initial components in our support websites just to lay out uh, that basic uh, navigation uh, when creating the projects. Okay. Mark, I've got a question here. If you Go want, you're, you're just talking about between uh, Windows and Linux. So as Ron was asking, if you're to use Linux, then how do you interface with most HMIs that are running Windows? Uh, well, there are a few uh, options to do that. Uh, when we have an architecture, uh, and let me, I try to explain that. So the question, let me see, is how to uh, interface with the HMIs. Okay. If you need to, ex if you have a Linux application that needs to exchange data with other HMI or other part of the systems, uh, right now for the future projects, one excellent way to do that is through the MQTT broker, <laughs> especially with an IoT project, be because uh, the Windows HMI and uh, the uh, Linux version both support the MQTT protocol. So that concept that you have explored to have the unified namespace to be the common representation of the data and the main devices, whatever they're running in Linux or Windows, read and write to that unified namespace, mm -hmm. that's uh, the best solution. On top of that, if you want to have a direct connection in between the stations, if both are running Factory Studio, we have a native protocol in between them. And if they are running another uh, software, we still can exchange data either from OPC or for Modbus. <laughs> uh, worst case scenario, you can even have a Modbus master and Modbus slave <laughs> and exchanging some direct connection with them between uh, the Modbus protocol. And of course, you can have a database in the middle like a SQL database at middle and exchange files. <laughs> okay. Those are only four or five connective options that are shipped <laughs> available to all HMIs. Some of them, they have like libraries or web services. They have more custom interface that you can explore. But one thing that I can tell you right now, uh, it's always possible and it's not complicated. So in some point of your project specification, you need to go on the details, but you can assume that that connection is possible and talk with us to the specifics because it's really connectivity. It's not a problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, even when it was a problem, we created more than 250 communication protocols <laughs> in, our, in our past 25 years to do that mm -hmm. by brute force. <laughs> And now it's easier that our modest standards out. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Good. Uh, so let me share again here my screen. And you keep me uh, help me with the questions because when I'm uh, sharing my display yet with the focus on my own uh, screen here, I don't sure. have the chat, chat window open, Togar. Okay. No problem. Anyway, uh, so uh, we create these little basic projects, okay? And if I go to tags, you see I have two tags out of the box. One called Server Monitor Info, that's a data structure, and another called UI. And we uh, understand, uh, and both are custom data types. And that helps you to understand some concepts of the products. You see the server monitor info is of domain server. It means if I have one, two, 10, 20 computers, 20 clients or visualization remotes connect with this application, the server information will be the same uh, to all those clients. Uh, because if I go to that template, you see uh, the server information is how much disk space I have available, how much memory, 
how much CPU I'm using. That's information about your server. Mm -hmm. So all your client applications, they should share uh, that same information. And we have also a display uh, showing that uh, basic uh, uh, information. Uh, uh, just a very, uh, it's one of, it's this one here, yeah. And we have a base uh, dashboard showing that uh, some basic information for your server that you can customize. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And by default, we create also another data structure called UI. This one is of type clients because when you are doing your projects, it's not only about the tags you're monitoring, it's also about uh, lots of additional data that you may have your application to control uh, things on the application. For instance, if you have an alarm window, an alarm page, you may want to have in that alarm page uh, some tags to hold a custom filter of the alarms. Or you may want to have in that alarm page to, do, to go to the history, I start dates and I end dates. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So uh, when you do your alarm page, you are definitely uh, going to have uh, in that alarm page something like that, where you have here the start dates where the user can select that date. <laughs> and you see it's mapped to that start date time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, the two key concepts uh, when you start bringing that data model to do the configuration of the product is to understand some basic features we have in the products. One of them is what I'm showing here, that we have that concept of several variables and client variables, okay? Okay. And to be clear, uh, the several variables are uh, the ones that all the clients they share and uh, the client variables each operator uh, the, that variable will have a different value in each computer okay okay uh, this cost of clients to some new users is a little uh, not that easy uh, Help here, Tolga. Is that clear, or perhaps I should explore a little bit more that concept of client tags? I would say there's no harm in explaining it a little more. So please. Okay. So let's do that. Well, in this case, I just create that process from scratch. I don't have any alarms happening, so don't the the uh, list is here empty. But okay. you see here, I have here. I can select. I start dates and I start time to filter the alarms. Okay. But try to picture that you are running this application, not only your computer, you're going to have two, 10, five, 20 external users also remotely access that server. You don't want, if you select another day here, that the other user opening that same screen at the same time, do we agree that they, that they should not change to their computer? <laughs> yeah. You are selecting the alarms you want to have in your computer, okay? Uh, the same the same way the user that I'm showing here, the username, is uh, the username of this computer or, uh, that's logging this computer. But some other information like the name of the project should be the same to all computers, okay? Yep. And the information about uh, the computer CPU or uh, something like that also should be available to all users, okay? So that's the concept of client and server. Uh, so client is a variable uh, like uh, that one, the status of the server computer, that mm -hmm. all HMIs in the application, all visualization will see the same value. Uh, and the client variables are uh, things like this, they start date time of the alarm. So when you're doing your screen, you put this variable here, that's of like clients 
So I can select my filter in my computer and another user will select with the same variable another filter to his computer, okay? Okay. And today is not really a train on alarms, uh, but uh, the way uh, it works, the configuration, uh, you pick up those tags and add uh, here in your alarm window. This application, what we did to combine both alarms and online in the same object, giving a little trick on configuration. So of creating two screens, we create only one screen to be online in history and LG trail. Mm -hmm. And based on that selection, uh, we show either the online message or the historical messages, okay? And here is the start and the end of my alarm page. And I won't do that because I don't want to mess with my application. Uh, or uh, one thing that people, they ask that frequent also, uh, or I did all those modifications and I don't need to save, uh, but I don't want that. Uh, we have this button that you can close the display without changing, okay? Okay. Uh, and I go to go a, a new display so I can play that. Uh, and uh, a, little, a small parenthesis here. Uh, in this template we created, we put the alarm page and the online page on the same screen, mm -hmm. also to be a little more advanced. But for most of the real life projects, frankly, I recommend to have one page for the online alarms and another page for the historical alarms, okay? Okay. And here in the bottle, you always show, of course, the online alarms. So uh, keep that in mind. And if you want to pick up our template and modify that, uh, our template will never be exactly what you want, even for simple things like alarms. So one thing that you can do if you want to have one page for online alarms and one page for historical alarms, you just hit this button here, save this place as, and I'm creating now one page that I call alarm history, mm -hmm. that I have all the basic functionality, but in that alarm history page, I don't need to have the online alarms and I don't need to have this combo box here doing the selection if it's online or historical, because in this page it would be always uh, history or G tray or whatever I want to be. Okay. Okay. Anyway, uh, let me close that parentheses and going back to data model. So imagine that that alarm page. If I do something like that, I create here one tag called alarm page initial dates that will be of type uh, date time and uh, and then I create another uh, tag that will be uh, the alarm page final time uh, I will be lots lots of tags here the application will be very confusing okay but if I create a tag that's type use interface and I put in, in, in top of the templates, all I need to manage my user interface. So I need variables to manage the alarm selection, the trend charts, and some other navigation. And on the alarm page, I create another data structure. And here I put everything for regard of alarms. Uh, can you see that's much more easy to understand the application, to use the application? Definitely. Uh, so if I am here adding to need this new screen, I'm creating a, a data picker object. And I want to map that to my alarm tag, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so when I go here to select the tag, uh, I don't need to have 10,000 tags there. I know, okay, that will be on the user interface. On the user interface is related with my alarms. And inside alarms, that will be the dates for my starts. Okay. Okay. It's much, much easier to access the information. Okay. 
And also, you don't need to worry about that client server because you said this UI tag is of type client. So when you go to the UI templates to see what is the template, uh, if I enable that column, that's the domain, you see here we have one thing called domain parent. Mm -hmm. It means this variable will reside in the server or on the clients according which variable is using this template. <laughs> For the ones that are not completely familiar with our product, template is the definition of a data structure. I use a data type. So that's the definition of my structure to manage the user interface. So what I'm saying here, that whoever is use that template, in that case, this variable, you'll be client or server. So when you work with data structure, there is no risk of forgetting to define if that variable is server side or client side. You don't need to worry that here, OK? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you have to do that configuration only one place here called UI, OK? So if you start now to bring your, your project data to here, if you understand a little bit your data model, you can create a template called sensor X. And uh, this uh, sensor X template, you are going to say that's a process value uh, and it's going to have uh, also uh, integer that's a status and there'll be some sort of on-off, whatever that makes sense. So that's what I have to that sensor data, okay? Okay. And I keep the default here, don't have to find nothing. And now I go to my turbine. Uh, when I go to my uh, turbine uh, data model, I, I know that this turbine, uh, uh, has uh, one sensor here uh, that, let's say, the sense is for vibration, whatever. And uh, we have one sensor that's very similar, but measuring temperature. And I know uh, some of those things I'm saying does not really make sense in the process, <laughs> but <laughs> make some abstraction here. Plus, I'm just trying to be generic here and simple. And also that turbine has a current, has a speed, some other variables. So here I, I create the data model for the turbine, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you are able to extract that data, if you see the turbine has also some sensors here. <laughs> so when I go to my main application and I did uh, a little uh, data analysis before to know that I will have to work uh, with uh, uh, a large, I can create tags through here also. Uh, so I did some uh, data analysis that go to my templates. Where is my turbine? It's here, okay. And I know we are going to work with lots of turbines that are very similar. I can even go here and create a variable called my turbine. That's one array of 100 positions. So with only one line in the database, I created already the data model for lots of process variables. <laughs> Uh, because right. each turbine has one, two, three, four variables, or in fact, more than four, because each sensor has three variables. <laughs> so uh, we have three, six, eight, around 10 variables in each turbine. So with just one line of configuration, if I go to my info project uh, tags, I see uh, that you have already more than 1,000 variables in this application. Wow, OK. And not only the definition of the data, it's easier. But if you have a good data model, a good organization, a good understanding of your components, everything you are going to do now on mapping the devices, doing scripts and display, you'll be much, much, much more easier when your data is well-defined. 
So don't work nowadays with connections, with screens, even with analytics. The reason of our platform is really, really very flexible to do all those things. By the way, of course, you can at any time, even the application is running, adds one more element to the turbine. You can modify uh, those data structures also easily. But it's very hard to lay out pro the application if you don't have the minimal understanding of your organization of your process. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, and Mark, and, go ahead. I was just going to say, before we continue that, just back to what you're talking about, arrays, Hezron has another question here. I said, so that is like using arrays for each sensor or motor and defining the variables? Well, uh, in this case, no. In this case, uh, if I understood correct the question, uh, you can do that uh, as well. Uh, you can define an array of, of sensors. But in this case, I'm doing something even more interesting. I'm creating an array of turbines. And the sensor is inside the turbine. Inside it, yeah. By the way, our array can be three-dimensional arrays, OK? But uh, uh, probably to be easier if I go to my screen and I decide to show here uh, some data of that turbine. I'm going to here to put an objects to do a text I.O. of type 2A that can be input or output or output only. Mm -hmm. And on the expression, I'm going to, to put tag dot my turbines, but by turbines an array. So I have to pick up uh, which position of the turbine I want to pick up. So position 23, then vibration sensor dot process variable. That's how you access the data, you see? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, you can make that even more generic. So now uh, here, instead of showing the process value of that sensor, I will show the status. And here in these other fields, instead of showing uh, the vibration, I will pick up the speeds of the turbine itself, OK? And uh, I can test the screen, but I know it will be working. And now I want to have that pace to show data from any turbine, what I can do. Uh, I could create a new tag called index or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that's a bad idea because that tag would be created here. And we don't want to have in that main list too much stuff here. <laughs> Uh, this index is going to select which turbine I want to have on my screen, only on my client computer. So let's see uh, for the audience. You reply yourself. It's server or client this variable? <laughs> Should be clients because I may want to see the turbine 10 and another use can want to see the turbine 20. Yeah. So if I have that index tag, I can put here a combo box or a, a selection list or anything. Uh, right now, to keep simple, I will put only an input box, OK? And map into the tag index. Uh, and on, on those objects here, instead of showing the turbine 23, I'm showing turbine the index <laughs> okay okay so basic uh based on that uh initial variable okay uh and i was doing online configuration on that so i can uh, go uh to that page oh, i need to say first and name the online configuration but anyway uh Put that on the main page. I want to put on page one. So give me a second here. Uh, main page. Here it is. Yeah. So here I'm showing data of turbine one. Uh, here I'm showing data of turbine two. Okay. And it would be nice uh, if you have some data here, but because I don't have a communication device, I can open my tools proper to watch 
mm-hmm. and uh, go here and go to to uh, tag dots uh, my turbine index one. So here I can modify the data of turbine index one, and here I will put the data of turbine index two. And I can uh, modify the date of turbine two, as you see here changing. Okay. So here is the date of turbine one, and here's the date of turbine two. Okay. Uh, so very easily, uh, you can create user interfaces or even uh, some math calculation. If I go to my script, I want to run some data every one second. And I go here uh, to that code, my coach editor, and I will do something th- like that. I will do for uh, uh, int uh, equals zero, or you can start from one if you prefer, or start accepts both. Okay. Uh, uh, and here uh, I will uh, do. Uh, something with that turbine data, whatever it is, okay? Uh, Probably not that. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, you see very easily, I'm creating displays and code that are generic because I have a good data model here, okay? And the key point, frankly, uh, it's not only uh, using arrays, but mainly the templates, because that <clears throat> that same index I'm using arrays, we can do direct with the templates. Mm-hmm. We can create generic symbols, generic displays, generic codes that will be applied in top of those user data types. Okay. Okay. And let's do some improvements on that application now. Uh, if I go to this index I just created, and I want to modify the type of the, modify the type, so this is disabled. Lots of people have that questions, because right now I'm using online configuration. So I need to run to run tests, and click here to do isolate the runtime from the configuration. Right now, my configuration tool and my application run they are disconnected. So I can go here and I can uh, do things like searching the type of the variables and doing other things that I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Uh, Because we don't allow you to do some modifications when you are online with the plants. (laughs) Because imagine how crazy it would be uh, to pick up that verb that's integer and say, okay, this variable is not an integer anymore. Now Mm -hmm. this variable is a data structure called alarm page. (laughs) What will happen with your calculation, what will happen with displays, the validation, little bit crazy, okay? Mm -hmm. So we don't allow you to do some modifications when the online configuration is running, but you can very easily disconnect, do your modifications, and then do our hot start to publish your modifications. But that's another training. Uh, keeping back in this data model, instead of having the find that index here, would be much, much better. I have this UI class that I should have everything regarding user interface. So it makes much more sense to have an index variable defined it here at the UI level. Okay? okay. So what I should have done in my display, instead of pick up a tag, that was in the root of the application, I should pick up inside the UI, okay? So when you really put some time thinking about the data, think about your variables, uh, you can do all those little optimizations that will be a huge time save in the future. And also allows you to prevent errors by better organization. Mm -hmm. For instance, this variable here, you may have an error and put sever by mistake or leave blank that will be sever. If you don't have that variable defined here, but inside the UI class, that's not a problem because everything under the UI is always of type clients. You don't need to worry, (laughs) Mm -hmm. okay? 
make uh, finding that Toger? Yeah, no, yes, I am. Okay, so the way you should start is uh, understand your data model, bring those data models to create your templates, having very good standard on tag names. In our software, we have a huge benefit that if you are using a variable and you change that variable to a better name, when you go back to the places on the application where you use that variable, the name is there. So it's very easy to do the refactoring. Mm -hmm. So you should use that benefit not to get lazy, but to modify a lot the name conventions on the beginning of your project specifications to change and evolve. So at the end of the day, the name of templates, the name of your objects, the name of your displays, the name of your alarm groups, uh, the name of your field devices, where you have the nodes, the channel, and do the mapping, the codes, the name of the tests you are running. You have good standards on those name conventions. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, they go beyond tag. They apply to everything on the application. Even using templates, sometimes you may have applications with dozens of screens. Even you have templates and reusing the same screen many times. So it's important to have those standards on the screen names as well. Okay. Okay. If you did, I, I spent lots of time, more than half an hour, 40 minutes, trying to stress importance of templates and, and data model. Uh, because if you do have that, the remaining of the implementation will go very quickly because even uh, our symbols, they are not good for you. Even you need to create your standard symbols, okay? Uh, you can pick up some basic symbols from our library, uh, break the symbol, uh, and to start then customizing uh, that symbol to whatever you want to do. And here uh, you put uh, your variable. So here I'm going to show data of uh, my uh, turbine, my uh, the expression here would be tag uh, dots my turbines, and then I'm put, putting hashtag index, and say that by default will be uh, the turbine number one. And here I will pick up uh, the temperature or the status. Uh, for the vibration sensor dot status. And here I'm going to create these other objects also in the symbol, uh, but mapping instead of pick up the index, uh, also using my little hashtag syntax here uh, to pick up uh, the position number one. So, uh, and now uh, if I create a symbol, uh with those objects uh, uh oops i don't want that watermark in my symbol and those two so i'm creating a symbol call uh just call uh the name of the symbol with turbine and now this symbol uh it's the default representation for a turbine you see here mapping only the index of the turbine. They don't need to map all the internal components because mm -hmm. it does that automatically. Uh, the same way, if I want to create a symbol to my sensor, I want to create here one little uh, bar graph showing uh, my uh, tag dots. Uh, well, I don't have a sensor tag, but go brief on that. Uh, if you create those symbols that the name of the symbol map the data structure, you can insert tags uh, in your application or copy paste from Excel or copy paste from the base definition. And when you do that, uh, that symbol will be automatically pick up the proper representation of that element, as you see happening right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going too much on detail with that because of time, it's not the idea also. But keep in mind, when you go to organize the visualization, creating symbol libraries, 
the math scripting, uh, the reports, how are going to manage, the, even the communication with the devices. Uh, if you have a good definition of the data model and, data, and if that data model is stable enough to allow some modification of names, edge of removing properties, but not a complete redesign, that's what you want to do uh, in the projects, okay? And there are, some, of course, some other obvious decisions for going to use HTML5.net, but those are very specific questions. I'm trying to put the focus on, okay, day zero of my projects, how I start to organize my data. So uh, summarizing, first, forget our product. Put some time to think about the data, the, the devices, the modeling of your factory, the modeling of your devices. <laughs> After that, you bring the tool, and instead of jumping the gun to going directly to the screens, mapping alarms, mapping the PLC to see the data in the screen, you can do that to make the people, the company happy. <laughs> but then for the long time, real projects, step back and think about your data types or use data types, the data model, how you organize that organization. And then the production of the map of the displays, I.O., alarm, scripting, you see you flow amazingly easy. It's just about get information, what they need from the end user, from the process specialists. You see the implementation of that like that. Mm -hmm. Most of our work in our product now, it's not doing the implementation. <laughs> it's maturing the specifications mm -hmm. from the process areas because the time to do the application can be amazingly fast when you have that information proper okay okay good i think that's good for today especially because of the time uh, but i did approach one very specific feature on the products and i see now that we need to receive questions from people to help us do more videos on how to approach a new project but uh, uh, talk about other areas of the application, the data communication, use interaction. There is lots of more or less, not standards, we call best practices in many areas that we need to explore beside that concept of templates. And we need to do that. And questions and specific questions will help on that for the future. That's it. Yeah, no, I thought that was great. You know, I think that the key takeaway here is to make sure that you define upfront, you know, uh, when you work with your data and it's really and no not a find upfront the data, yeah. not to match the visualization of yeah. the areas. The key is to find upfront and to know what focus the energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, well, we're going to continue these uh, fundamental series and then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start delve into advanced topics. But in the meantime, if you are tuned in and you've got some suggestions or questions or topics that you want covered, we're definitely open to hearing that out. And you can always submit that on forum.tatsoft.com or you can just message us uh, here on LinkedIn. So is there anything else that you wanted to discuss here today? No, I think I'm good for today. All right, well, thank you very much for that, Mark. And as you know, we do this every week, Thursday at noon central. So we will announce next week's topic on Tuesday. Thank you very much for tuning in. And thank you, Mark, for your time. I appreciate it. And everyone have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, bye.